This meeting is being live streamed. Let's check on YouTube if things are good. Okay, perfect. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Carwan. My name is Ishan Sharma. And you are watching the Carwan keynote, one of the most important uh, even evenings at Carwan that we all look forward to. And today it's very uh, special for us at Carwan because uh, we have with us somebody who has been an inspiration to the whole project of Carwan and whose work we have followed for many years in Goa. And I hope that you'll enjoy the session today. Uh, so I'll, I'll formally introduce the speaker now, who is profound expertise in decoding Goa's history through the architectural heritage has illuminated uh, the cultural and historical scene in Goa and world over through her research. Heta Pandit's scholarly journey has been has been one marked by dedication and intellectual curiosity. Her initial foray in the world of ethology along the alongside the renowned Jane Goodell on the chimpanzee research uh, station in Tanzania, East Africa laid the foundation of a lifelong commitment uh, to understanding and preserving heritage. Her return to India in 1981 marked the beginning of her association with the Bombay Environmental Action Group and her pioneering efforts in initiating heritage conservation and preservation projects through the India Heritage Society. Indian Heritage Society Bombay chapter. And it was during this period that she identified the vital need to protect and conserve the invaluable heritage of Goa. The year 1983 was kind of a turning point in uh, Ms. Pandit's life as she witnessed the traumatic riots that shook her city of Bombay. It was then that she made the profound decision, important decision to leave the city and go to Munnar and then later shift to Goa. In these, uh, you know, for us, it is the serene surroundings of Goa that she channeled her unwavering energy and dedication, passion into the preservation of Goan houses, a mission that has defined her ever since. Her scholarly contributions extend beyond the spoken word. With 11 meticulously researched books on Goan heritage, including Houses of Goa, Hidden Hands, Master Builders of Goa, and Grinding Stories, Songs from Goa, she has played a pivotal role in conserving and sharing the wealth of knowledge encapsulated within the architectural treasures of the city and the state of Goa. In addition to her vast knowledge and relentless pursuit of heritage preservation, Heta Pandit holds the distinguished title of a Homi Bhava Fellow, a recognition of her exceptional contributions to the field of heritage preservation. She is also the founder member of the Goa Heritage Action Group, an organization dedicated to safeguarding and promotion of Goa's rich heritage. In today's session, uh, she is going to talk about, and she's going to, she's inviting us on a scholarly voyage that transcends time and delves into the enigmatic past of Goa. Through meticulous research and passionate uh, exploration, she unveils the rare and awe-inspiring petroglyphs in Goa, a testament to human existence that spans an astounding uh, 10,000 years. She guides us to the hollowed Tamdi Surla temple, a treasure trove of architectural and cultural significance. And then also as a connoisseur of heritage, if one has to say in architecture, Ms. Pandit extends her scholarly purview to the lesser known and modest dwellings uh, nestled in the remote uh, corners of agrarian Goa. Simultaneously, she takes us on a journey or a captivating journey through the grand mansion that serves as living testaments to the diverse lifestyles that have thrived within this remarkable place of Goa. So without further ado and this uh, detailed introduction to one of my favorite speakers on Karwan till now, uh, Heta, thank you so much for accepting my invitation, our invitation. It is truly an honor hosting you uh, this evening. And I hope to uh, have a great conversation post this uh, presentation. So over to you and we look forward to learning so much from you this evening. Thank you once again. 
Thank you, Ishan, and thank you to Karwan for inviting me to speak today. I just wanted to, at the outset, say that it's very, this is a kind of topic that needs a panel discussion of several experts from various fields, but I'll do my best. And also that Goa has many, many layers of historical evidence. It's not possible to uh, bring every aspect of this evidence to a slideshow in an hour's time. Besides, we don't even have the architectural evidence physical, physically in Goa. So we are going to have to make do. Some of our viewers may find some gaps in the presentation, but that's because of these two reasons. So without further uh, delay, I want to start with the first uh, slide in, the, in my presentation. I'm going to open with the petroglyphs. Now, not many people know that uh, Goa had, has these kind of petroglyphs in an area called Rivona. And all along the Konkan, there are some 15,000 such petroglyphs of animals, birds, mandalas, uh, and, and, and various bows and arrows and various other figurines also carved on stone. These are between 9,000 and 10,000 years old, according to the experts. And uh, without going too much in detail, I would say this is the first architectural evidence of Goan society as, not as we know it today, but as it was in the past. Now, how did it all begin? It began with this intriguing device. It's called the Manosh or sluice gate. And if you notice, there are some wooden uh, slats or gates which open and close with the force of the water. It's a highly complex system. And this system enabled Goan farmers to keep out salt water, bring in fresh water, plant agricultural land, and turn saline land into fertile paddy fields and coconut groves. So this, I would say, is the backbone of Goan agriculture, which in turn is the backbone of architecture, settlements, and Goan society. Here you see a temple against the backdrop of a paddy field and coconuts. And a lot of our lives revolved around temples and churches after conversion. And we always managed to pay respect to our ancestors, to our uh, gods, and so on. That, that spiritual aspect of Goan society has never been, has never changed over centuries. When I talk of settlements, the whole arrangement is quite quite intriguing. So you had the Manosh sluice gate at the bottom where the paddy fields were there and water was controlled, land was controlled, and land was converted from saline wasteland to agricultural rich paddy fields. But the system was for fresh water was equally intriguing. The hill slopes, which are now uh, being very sadly developed and built upon, were never meant for development and tampering. The water, rainwater would collect and the trees at the top of the slopes would collect water, use them, release them like sponges and the water would flow down to the villages of Goa uh, in streams and recharge our community wells and private wells. And what fascinates most visitors to Goa is that Almost every house has a well outside the kitchen. Even my house in Saligaon has a well. So we knew and we understood the value of uh, fresh water and good, uh, good water, how to uh, save ourselves from contamination and to allow water to free flow through the villages and into the sea. So this was part of the whole ecosystem of being in a Goan village. Now here you see, this is a village of Saligaon and how houses were clustered. Now why were houses in clustered? 
very often you have visitors who are not familiar with these clusters. They ask you to look for a house on the beach in, uh, isolate, in, in isolation. And uh, when I tell them that all our heritage houses are built in clusters in the village. So why were these clusters formed? Because these lands were not fertile. They were not to be planted. That is why you have these settlements that you see in this Google map, like clustered. And clustered on morodes. What is a morod? A morod is a slightly higher ground. So the paddy fields were at a lower ground where they took the water in, used the water, and the houses had, they didn't get their feet well, wet, if you know what I mean. This is an amazing system, actually. Now, if you uh, planted paddy, it was fine. You planted it in the 90 days of the monsoon. But after the rains got over, you had this amazing device called a lath. A lath is the first system by which a pole is kept at an angle alongside a, a well that is dug in the field. And as you see this gentleman doing, the farmer, he puts, he uses the lard manually, put, lowers the bucket in the dip or in the pit in front of him. This is purely seasonal. If you go now in the rains to look for a lard, you won't find it. If you look, uh, look for a well like this, you won't find it. But this is after the rains, the winter crop of vegetables and local vegetables at that. So a lot is also very, very important device or evidence of how Goan farmers survived after the paddy fields were uh, the season was over. Now comes to the spiritual history of Goa. What is this that I'm showing you? Actually, the slide on my left is no deity, no idol, no form that is being worshipped. He's called a Rakantar or a guardian spirit. A guardian spirit is assumed to live under trees or in a shrine on the roadside and everyone, irrespective of what faith they follow, Hindu or Christian, will always venerate or bow to a Rakandar. There are lots and lots of stories about Raknos or Rakandars, how they don't tolerate bad behavior, how they guide you if you get lost in the night, how they find lost articles for you. And interesting enough, see the, the Rakandars or Raknos will always have a very local presence. They are not like guardians of the whole of Goa, for example. They guard small fields, they will guard the crossroad, they'll guard the T junction or a Y junction and so on. So it's very, very charming at the same time, very meaningful. And here I'm mixing up myth, legend and history because this is very much part of our lives in Goa. Now here you see is a deity called a Dandeshwar. Now in the, before Aryanization, or the use of Vedic uh, hymns and so on, we had these deities or guardian spirit that we worshipped or venerated. They are not to be caged. That is the important part. Not to be caged, not to be put in a shrine, not to be put under uh, four walls or a roof and so on. They are to be worshipped in passing and you can appeal to them or thank them for any boon that is granted to you. This is Dandeshwar. Otherwise called Dandya. So there's a nickname for your God also, for your guardian spirit. That is the kind of friendly relationship one had with uh, a guardian spirit. To my right, you see somebody called a Nagro Betal. Now I call him a somebody because he's a very, very conscious, aware, alert guardian spirit. After years and years or maybe centuries of meditation, his chest has gone in, his eyes are bulging out, his two teeth incisors are out, his ribs are showing, and he's carrying on his in his left hand a cup which, with a ram under it. 
So this may indicate that animal sacrifice was practiced in Goa. He also believed, he's also believed to have walked through the village. And as he was leaving the village, the villagers pleaded and appealed to him and asked him to stay back. And he said, I will stay back only if you give me a virgin with 100 sons. Now a virgin with 100 sons, is, a, is that even possible? But it became possible because the villagers offered him an areca nut uh, palm frond with a hundred suparis or areca nuts in them. So that is what made him stay. And even today, and he said he will take a bath in the well. So no well is covered in the village of Lolie, where he is, where he stands. And uh, he's given, he's offered a dhoti not to wear as a garment, but to wipe himself after he takes a bath in the well. And people still, till today, leave a pile of cow dung uh, against the wall of their well. So for him to scrub himself, to use as a scrub. So these are some of the charming myth, legends, stories that we actually practice even today. This is very much part of our history. Now I've often been asked why the roads in Goa are so winding, always meandering and never straight. The reason is right before you, the roads or the walking paths were created by cows. And cows don't walk in straight lines. So we have first the cattle path, then people following the cattle, and then the roads. That is the simplest explanation I have to offer for these winding roads in Goa. Another very important feature is signage and milestones. This signage is uh, from Panjim at, uh, at the Pato Bridge, and uh, the old spellings are used. Now, Panjim is a relatively new city. It's 180 years old. It came into existence uh, by the name of Nova Goa when Old Goa fell, Velia Goa fell. So, uh, to play cholera and so on. And a lot of stones that you see in Panjim today, the building stones, they've actually come and encouraged to be brought from Old Goa by the ruling government of that time. So signage is an important architectural feature that gives you a lot of information, old spellings, for example, of places, and also how easy it was. Like Margao is probably 72 kilometers now away, but the signage is simple because that was the next most important city after Panjim. The simplest house in remote Goa in an agrarian surrounding, coconut trees, flowering plants, and a compound wall made out of uh, simple things like sticks and bamboo. Often these compound walls were live also. They were live fences. This is Lakshmi Vishnu Harvalkar's house. We go to her house quite often. She's a singer, a storyteller, a dancer, and a teacher. And she teaches uh, her skills to other uh, younger women also. So this is one of our favorite uh, destinations actually in Goa. The mud road leads you to her house. And if you look deep into her entrance, you'll see something like a small compound wall, not even six inches high. That is called a kare. And there's a lot of preparation that goes into a kare. But this architectural feature is the beginning of the Balkan that I'm going to show you later. Agriculture, as I said, happened because of the Manoj and the holding back of the, uh, of the rain, of the salt water. But there is another form of agriculture carried out by the Dhangars, Relips, and Gaude community, generally collectively known as the uh, Kangars or uh, the people who work with the uh, kunbis, who work with the ground, with the land. So here is a farmer uh, farming for nachni or ragi. It's a simple method. Earlier they used to do slash and burn farming in the hills, but uh, now they don't uh, go that often to the hills. If they have a plot of land, they will till the land with, with animals. And that is how they'll grow enough for themselves 
uh, and their families. This is not for sale. This is not big cooperative farming. This is not big agriculture like the paddy fields, no large holdings, very small pocket size holdings. And the best part is the social history part of this is that all the neighbors pitch in. So if you have uh, a farm that needs to be plowed and so on, you, you will call the neighbors to help you with the plowing. And then in turn, you will take your bullocks there and your wooden plow and uh, help the neighbor with farming. So this is cooperative farming, but not uh, in an organized fashion. It's very informal setup. This is a bridge called a sakar. All our own remote villages have them and still and use them. This is the, a simple bamboo bridge used by a lot of our villagers. This one is from Rivona. And they take it down in the rains because the water, uh, river water rises and the, uh, the bamboo gets rotten anyway. So it's like a foldable mobile bridge. Now they'll put it up again after the rains, uh, after the monsoon is over. So this is a, a very uh, intriguing and a very simple device that help village, connect villages. Otherwise, there is no way that two villages in Goa can get connected. In fact, years ago, when I'd gone to a village, a remote village, the villagers did not even know at, at, that there was another settlement at the top of the hill till there was a landslide and baskets and clay pots came rolling down. That is the kind of communication or lack of it that we are talking about. Now, there were, there's always talk of big battles and uh, wars being fought in any country, any region, and so on. But in Goa, we found a lot of these hero stones uh, in various parts, scattered in remote parts of Goa. A, remo a hero stone or a veera girl or veera hull is read from bottom to top. So it's like a bit like a graphic novel of today where you see a battle scene, a beheading or a martyrdom of a soldier at the bottom. Then the angels come and take the soldier or the martyred soldier up into heaven. And Shiva himself, uh, there's a Shivalingam there. Shiva himself welcomes the martyred soldier to heaven. Now, what is interesting is that there were even women soldiers, apparently. This one, this picture doesn't have, but there were warriors on horseback, uh, so they're obviously women soldiers as well. This is a slightly disturbing slide, a picture of a sati stone. Sati was very much practiced. As you see the small figurine on the left, there is a battle, two soldiers are fighting, the uh, wife probably lost her husband in this small skirmish or battle, and she then chooses to uh, immolate herself. And all the sati stones are pro uh, projected like this, a large head with a, a big eye at the center, which represents the third eye, I'm assuming that. And in the right palm of the sati, there is the sun. So she is holding the sun in her right palm. She's also giving you a blessing. And a lot of the offerings, if you see in the corner, there is a little peg where you offer green bangles. So unmarried girls will offer green bangles in the hope of getting a good husband. And uh, married women will offer green bangles and appeal to the sati uh, for the long life of their husbands. So this is how it works even today in Goa. Now we come to the Kadamba period. So I'm jumping a few centuries because the Kadambas ruled over Goa from Banvasipuram in Karnataka uh, in the 8th, 9th, 10th century. And there were two families of Kadambas. Uh, some were Shiva worshippers, some were uh, moon or Vishnu worshippers. And uh, this is the Kadamba lion, which somehow got left out undamaged beautifully preserved, long tail, uh, wide mouth with a tongue hanging out, right out. And the, the ears are not so much uh, 
so so much lion like and the claws are also more like hooves rather than claws but uh, this is a male lion going by the genitals and uh, this is the kadamba lion that has been preserved uh, at the reish magosh uh, church at the foot of the church so if you go to the reish magosh fort on a visit or to the reish magosh church which is dedicated to the three kings the magai you will see the kadamba lion there we are very fortunate to have this evidence of our history still intact going back to kadambas we uh, took a trip to shri mahadev temple which is done in the hoysala style uh, 9th century beautifully carved shiva temple it's got the shivlingam in it and uh, this is probably the finest example of uh, the kadamba period in uh, goa what is intriguing is another temple close by which at a village called taladi and this has caricatures at the base or the plinth of the temple so here you see a lion which is not quite a lion it's got a human face it's got a crown it's got a laughing lion head behind the mask uh, of a human mask the tail is extraordinarily long and ends in a kind of plume at the base of the plinth just below the head there are so there's a soldier on horseback behind the prince or the king but is looking quite dismal and on in a reverse image also on the same plinth we see the same lion with the same mask with the same crown and the laugh, laughter but the soldiers have been taken out of the horses and they are walking with rather grumpy expressions on their faces so i don't know what the artist was trying to say but my deduction is that there is a prince who wasn't very ready prepared for war he leads his soldiers loses the battle or is not very serious about the whole fight therefore the laughter and has put a lot of lives at stake but this is rather unusual to see a caricature in stone and is one of our most intriguing uh, evidence of goan political history we don't know who the prince was could be a, a, a small princeling state over there in the region but speaking of lions now we don't know whether the kadamba lions have moved around all over goa but you see these rather uh, comical i would say lions on gate posts and the actually the lions were used by the portuguese as well by the portuguese king so we don't know whether these are pointing a, a, a like a hangover from the portuguese but i feel uh, my feeling is that it, it's more like caricatures or a, a good laugh at the lions of kadamba period we also have something called the kula ghats now kula ghats are actually um areca nut plantations and uh, landlords had these areca nut plantation but why it's in this presentation is because there was a beautiful arrangement of watering the kula ghats you had a vast plantation impossible to water uh, so what they had is a big tank at the top of the hill and a series of channels water channels So the, you can see one channel to the left of these uh, Vedic novitiates that uh, have been photographed, and through these channels, a series of channels, and using gravity, they watered the entire areca nut plantation. Another very interesting thing about areca nut farming is that you climb one tree, and the tree is so tender. that you bend that one tree and go from one tree to the next to the next to the next and you you don't get down till lunch time so that is a, a fun thing about areca nut plantations it's a practically low maintenance as as a farm very eco friendly now i would like to speak about small plantations like every house in goa has in the backyard or the side yard or a or a courtyard 
a bananas growing, papayas growing, just enough for their own family needs. So commercial plantation is one thing, large holdings, especially in South Goa, but in the North, we didn't have large holdings. So we made do with small plantations and kitchen gardens. And these are the, some of the things that were planted by both Hindu and Catholic houses um, to, for, to fulfill their own needs. Another very interesting feature is for people who are interested in landscape planning and landscapes, that in Goa, we had courtyards and kitchen gardens, but because women had access to only the courtyards and not the front gardens for obvious reasons, for reasons of uh, gender segregation, they would plant flowers in the backyards or the courtyards, which they had access to. And the hibiscus is very dear to Hindu homes because the hibiscus reminds them of uh, Sri Ganesha, uh, the, the big ears and the proboscis and the trunk. So uh, hibiscus is something uh, that is planted by almost every home in Goa. And it also has medicinal value, coughs and colds. And a lot of the medicinal plants were simply grown in kitchen gardens at the back or in the courtyards which women had access to. What were the trees and plants in the old days that were planted in the front garden? Now I'm talking about Catholic homes and mango trees you will find were all planted in the front. There's a historical reason for that. That is because the Jesuits were very good at hybridizing the mango. And we've got a vast variety of mango uh, fruit in Goa. So you couldn't call the priest to the backyard because he was a priest, or the parish priest or the Jesuit priest. So you planted the mango tree so the Jesuit priest could visit you uh, and uh, inspect the progress of the mango tree. That's why you see mango trees in the front and all the other kitchen garden plants and uh, even the tamarind tree always at the back. Now, community wells are more than just water supply. As I was saying, the water used to come down the hills through hidden streams and, uh, uh, and, and, and charge the wells. And those who did not have private wells of their own in their own uh, houses, they would come to the community wells. And the community well was not just a source of water. It was also a source of exchanging news. This was one place which was socially acceptable for women to go any time of the day, not in the night, any time of the day, interact with other women who were there, do their washing, bathe the children. And what is most uh, interesting is that every community well in the old days had a soap nut uh, tree close to it. So you simply collected the soap nuts in season, I think it fruits in February, and collect all your nuts and use the soap nut. It was such an eco-friendly way of washing uh, your clothes, your utensils, and shampoo. Now we come to the heritage houses of the world. How conversion changed domestic architecture. Let us look at the Balkan. This is my house, by the way, in Saligao. You can see those seats in front and uh, you see the seat, uh, there's a wooden seating and there's a stone seating in front. This is where the life changed for the Goans after conversion. Before conversion, there was segregation of the genders. Men and women did not sit together out in the open like this, even in private. And after conversion, they were allowed to sit together. So this changed the whole social life. Another thing that changed was the windows. You see these large windows at eye level. Now, earlier there were windows at the top, windows at the bottom. So passers-by could never look in. Or they were bars shaped like this on the windows if they were at eye level. So they allowed sunlight to go out, but no sunlight to come in. So this is how you afforded privacy to a householder or the women of the house. And that changed after conversion. If you see at the top of the window, there are small ventilators. There's molding 
Now this molding was made by handmade country tiles and then a roof with Mangalore tiles. Mangalore tiles are only 120 years old. Uh, but before that, there were these handmade country tiles. And these country tiles were made from elbow to uh, wrist. A wooden mold would be made and the country tile would be made of clay left to dry in the sun. What a perfect product to make with absolutely zero investment, no machinery, nothing. And the potters would make the country tiles. This allowed the house to breathe. So it was backed with lime. And even today, if you use lime on the walls, your house will, house will breathe. The hot air will rise from the balcony, from the garden, out up to the high roof and out from the ventilators. So this was the best way of climatic adaptation of a Goan house. How it changed domestic architecture again after conversion, as I was saying, the windows are at eye level. And why did we start using mother of pearl shell windows? Because glass was very expensive. It came to Goa only in 1840 to 1890. Everybody couldn't afford glass. So they found the nacre of the mother of pearl shell after the mother of pearl shell was harvested for food, for medicine, and for ornamentation. The pearls were harvested. So, and for, uh, that is how they used the nacre of the mother of pearl shell, which was otherwise a waste product. So the Goan builder and uh, uh, the Goan uh, worker, craftsperson, and the householder was very, very thrifty in, a, in his or her approach to architecture and to generally to lifestyle also. This we have borrowed from Houses of Goa. We had called it at that time a typical floor plan, but now after so many years, I find that there's no really no typical uh, floor plan because there's some variation or the other. But in a Hindu home, there was always a courtyard that was in the center because the tulsi or the sacred basil was always in the center and the women of the house did a puja or a, with their votive offerings every single morning to the tulas or the tulsi vrindavan which represented the four corners of the world. That's why the tulsi or tulas vrindavan is always four cornered uh, with a lot of ornamentation nowadays. But the earliest one was simple clay ones. And this is why the courtyard or called the Raj Angan was in the center of the house. Around the courtyard were these rooms and every son of the house had his own room with his family. The temple for the family was separate. There was a separate well for the temple, a separate washing area. There's no concept of master bedroom in a Hindu home. Now we come to the Catholic houses, which were highly ornamented. You see, you saw the window of my house, but there was a whole bunch of windows with imported glass and colored glass, not stained glass, colored glass in Goan homes that belonged to the Catholics. There was a whole new found wealth that was on display. So this was a pivotal change. Hindu homes were not meant for display. They were in, inward looking. Catholic homes after conversion became outward looking and they were meant for display. They were meant for showing off. They were meant for the mixing of, of the classes and the mixing of uh, genders. Here we have a floor plan of a Catholic house. Again, I want to repeat that this is not typical. There are slight variations. But as you see, number two is called a sala. A sala is a ballroom or a hall. And this wealthy house, you will see you enter, which is at the balcony, which I, which I showed you in my house in Saligaon. And then you have two wings that go to either side, right wing, left wing. Sometimes they would have their own place for a band or a choir. And then you went into the house. Now, the interesting th thing about a Catholic house is that the back rooms, which were functional, like the kitchen or the firewood shed or the staff quarters or where the animals were kept, they were all had cow dung flooring 
and they were all built in the traditional Indian style. So they retained that Indianness for the back and the front they kept as a showroom or show house, I would say. A lot of columns that you see in Goan homes intrigue a lot of our visitors. They say that, oh, where did this column come from? Is it Ionic? Is it Corinthian? No, we didn't follow any classical style. We followed our own eclectic style. Each house you will see sometimes has its own uh, design of a column that supports the high pitch roof over the entrance. And the reason being is that a lot of these columns were made with the laterite blocks. And laterite cannot be carved in one long uh, piece. It is too brittle for that. So they would carve it in circles and they would carve it in cubes and pile one on top of the other. And that is how this whole style developed. It's a uniquely going thing to do, an eclectic column. Here we come to Kavi art. This art I found in 1998, but did not realize the importance of it. It is etching on walls. It may look like paint, but it's not paint. It is etched, so the, it is, and it's a soil art as well. To the left, you see Garuda rescuing a king cobra. Now in common lexicon, they are enemies. But here in Goa, I was told that you rescue your enemy if your enemy is drowning. So Garuda rescues the king cobra and this has been um, made into a Kavi art form and a narrative in some of our temples in Goa. To my right, this art form is common to both Catholic and uh, Hindu sacred spaces. So you can call it a soil art, you can call it a sacred art. And here we see the double-headed eagle, which was the symbol of the Augustinians, also the Habsburgs, and also the Gunda Barunda in uh, Canada. So it has definitely come from Europe with the Augustinians. And this is how it is portrayed at the old Archiepiscopal Palace in Old Goa. This is also Kavi, but sometimes called Scrafito. It's a simple translation of uh, scratching or etching. Now, how did we build? We didn't get JCBs and bulldozers in the old days. We built to the lie of the land. Here you see a familiar church, the Church of Our Lady of Immaculate Conception in Panjim. And you see lots of steps in the front. This is because you wanted your uh, worshippers and devotees to reach the church over the steps. This is what um, represented the what was to follow. Domestic architecture took cue from church architecture. Here you see a house, lots of steps, followed the lie of the land. But if you went into the house and you went to the back, it will be flat. So is the church, Our Lady of Immaculate Conception. If you go through the church and you step on the side, it will be flat to the land. So you followed the lie of the land without much excavation. Now, I would be failing in my duty if I didn't mention some of the forts of Goa. I'm not an expert on forts, but there are about 155 forts or remnants or ruins of forts in Goa. I won't go into the details because I don't know enough about it. This is the Reish Magos fort. And uh, it was a very, very important outpost when the Portuguese ruled over, over Goa. But what is uh, interesting is that church architecture influenced Goan domestic architecture, which is which I'm dating to late 19th to early 20th century, but fort architecture did not influence domestic architecture at all. Here we have the Safa Masjid built by the Adil Shah from Bijapur, who ruled over Goa for a very short time, only 70 years. And he built this Masjid in 1560. And even this, it has no influence, no carry forward into domestic architecture. 
Now, why were chapels and altars so prominent in a Catholic house? You probably guessed why. Because these were the place, spaces or special arrangements in a Goan Catholic home that was open to the public, open to visitors. Everybody wanted to show their altar, to show their relics, to show what they had in their altars and chapels. And this is a, this is a very prominent thing. What is interesting to me is that they carried forward the Hindu concept of a plethora of goddesses and gods. And they didn't have gods and goddesses, but in the Catholic altar or chapel, they had a whole bunch of saints, patron saints, and so on, especially Santana or Saint Anne, who was the mother of Mother Mary, with a book and instructing Mother Mary, who was a child at that time. So this is almost every altar or chapel has this, um, this feature or this uh, icon. Why were some family temples open for public access and worship? There were some like Damodar Sal in uh, Margaon, for example, uh, which allowed people to walk into their homes. It was separated and they believed that Damodar walks through the village or what was village once, Margaon, Matagram, uh, in the night on a horse. And therefore his shrine or his temple, though it's part of a private house, cannot be uh, denied access to his devotees. That was one reason why it was open. Somehow, somehow temple tanks were also open to the public. Every family had their own uh, 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 Kul Deva or uh, Kul Devi, who's the family god or goddesses, a clan Deva or Devi who was, who was for the whole clan and then a village uh, god and goddess. So when, when these hierarchy or categories are there, you decide which ones will be accessible to the public. And this is, and as long as the gods are venerated respectfully, I think access is not denied. So we're talking about safety and security at a time when decoits roamed around Goa on horseback, especially in remote areas like this house in Sour Day. This house in Sour Day has got a loft. This is a picture of the loft. And it has windows that are sliding up and down that can be controlled how much you want to open. And we imagine that this was like a, a room where you could see all four sides, three sides, and you could see approaching horsemen or decoits uh, to the, uh, that came in the night. So this is probably like a vigil room or, or a sniper room. Uh, you can, but they, there was this real, very real threat. In fact, in some of the houses that we visited, Gaunekar house, for example, there are, there are bullet holes or uh, gun holes where they used to shoot from. And uh, in one house in Shandor, they even have a trap door, which is hidden, well hidden, because it's inside. At the on the floor of a uh, of a kitchen cabinet, so you would never imagine that there's a trap door uh, in the kitchen cabinet. You walk through the trap door, went down, and shot at these uh, decoits. So this was a very real threat in those days. Uh, we've come to the last picture, and what I've what. We've been studying houses of Goa for since 1998. And they, to me, they are forever fascinating because they're evidence of not just family histories, but also the history of the entire community to which they belong. Travel history, for example, education history, who went to France to become a doctor, who went to Germany to become an engineer, who went to China for trading and brought back artifacts. And some of these houses have added rooms to accommodate the artifacts that the traveler went out and brought. So this to me is Goan history in a capsule, in a nutshell. Thank you very much for listening. If there are any questions, I think our moderator will uh, pass them to me. And, uh,
thank you so much heta for this brilliant uh, session because i have never been to goa but through your lecture i could get a, a sneak peek into what goa truly means and uh, in increasing commercialization in present times uh, finding true essence of a city is very difficult so what you have captured in today's talk is that true essence of goa and the way you have talked also about the pre conversion and post conversion houses and how that has that has uh that, that is clearly visually uh, there in the architecture whether it is the the the, the shift of the veranda styles that you uh, uh illustrated in the talk i think that is very interesting and uh also uh, i was thinking because uh, as history students you get to study temples as 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 landed magnets how temple grants were given in early india but then uh, you know how in goa we see the conversions of religious space and personal space into one and how there's no really uh, difference between the two as you uh, as you uh, illustrated both in hindu houses as well as uh, catholic and christian houses that is that's really interesting and i hope that we can have you again to talk about early history of goa as well to further go back in time and see how it all started so uh, i think there is one question uh, okay that, that's that's about the dating of the petroglyphs uh, so for the, for that you have to study uh, anthropology my friend and then maybe you can also date i think mostly they are dated with carbon dating and other yeah. formats but yeah either do you want to comment uh, on that from, uh, from what i understand the petroglyphs in the konkan they've been studied by several experts and they say between 10 and 20000 years old um, but who did them whether they were roaming people or whether they had some connection with astronomy uh, we don't know uh, but uh, but the ones in goa they say at rivona they are the experts are saying that they are dated to 9000 about 9000 years old and uh, how do you see as a conservator as a as a conservator heritage conservator in goa how do you see the uh, the the going away of the portuguese heritage in goa especially the houses and i i think there might be apartmentalization happening in goa as well and now people yeah. are going into our apartments yeah but there is also a parallel movement ishan where uh, people are uh, buying up uh, heritage homes and i like to prefer to call them goan houses although some people do call them indo portuguese but i prefer to call them goan houses because they were built at the end of 19th and beginning of early 20th century when the power of the portuguese was at a decline and these houses were built by people who were uh, wealthy uh, educated traveled uh, and also had a very very strong sense of goan identity so i won't uh, say that this is uh, portuguese influence but there are some influences but then all our cuisine and architecture both has come under lot of influences because we were ruled by so many people so there's Persian, Arab, uh, Indian, Malaysian, Indonesian, yeah. Chinese, Japanese, European, so many influences. That's very true. In in one of your uh, articles long back, you mentioned how art collection is not very uh, was not very common in Goa, but art was more for functionality purposes. and that's yeah. how you see art in uh, in architecture as well in houses of uh, goans you mean fine art when you say art you mean fine art uh, yes painting sculptures and so on yes. yeah it was uh, goan artists were not considered uh, i'm talking about maybe uh, 15 15 20 years ago they were not considered to be of world class uh, standard but now that has changed uh goan artists are being noticed they are being uh, valued and uh, i'm very happy to say that uh, you know goa heritage action group with its festivals that we had 
we exposed our artists, not just exposed our artists to visitors, but we also brought in speakers uh, from outside uh, Goa to speak to them about how to uh, develop, how to grow, how to market their art and so on. So that has come, uh, we've come a long way since that. I'm happy. That, that's very true. And uh, we would like to thank you, Heta, for taking out time to deliver this month's and this year's Carvan keynote. It was truly an honor hosting you. And I hope that I'll host you for an offline uh, lecture, in-person lecture someday, Certainly. where we can also meet and interact more. Thank you so much, everybody who joined us Thanks. on a very busy day. It's the India-Pakistan <laughs> match. But I was happy to see a lot of uh, viewers on, on YouTube. And people will be watching this later on. Don't forget to like the video and drop comments in the chat and uh, if you have any questions for Eta and if you're watching this video later please send us on email carvanheritage at gmail.com we'll forward those emails to Eta and she can get back to you on email uh, thank you so much everybody thank you so much Eta thank uh, you and Karvan. look forward to your guidance uh, in our project as well <laughs> pleasure is all mine anytime Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank and you. thank you to Hari who was behind the technical aspects of the talk. So Hari is also somebody who should be thanked <laughs> and his hand is clearly seen. Thank you, Hari. Thank, thank you so much, Heta, for... And I'd like to thank all the photographers who, who've given us uh, all the photos very freely. To Gerard Dakuni especially, the publisher of Houses of Goa, for giving us permission to use uh, the floor plans. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. And do get her book on Houses of Goa, which came long back. But recently, she, she came up with a book called Stories from the Houses of Goa that uh, you can uh, read. And I think we'll have another session of, on that someday where she can share stories, some interesting stories behind these houses. Thank you so much, everybody. Take good thank care you. and keep reading, keep questioning. That's how you will keep yourself sane in insane times. With that, we'll meet again. Have a great evening ahead. Thank you.